Welcome to Nerds at Church, a podcast about nerdery and the Bible. I'm Pastor Emily, and I use pronouns like they, them, theirs. And I'm Pastor Kay, and my pronouns are she, her. In this episode, we'll discuss the 13th Sunday after Pentecost, also known as Proper 18 or Lectionary 23, which this year falls on the 4th of September. We do have a couple of content notes for you. We talk about reproductive justice, including sterilization, abortion, and other issues, as well as genocide when discussing the deep dive. And we talk about slavery when we talk about the Philemon reading and also throughout the episode. Check out the episode description for links to the Bible passages and other references we make in this episode. Today, for our deep dive, we talk about the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Yay! 42. Yeah. Okay, maybe just the first part. Life. Life is good. Also, for those who may have not caught the part where we explained where we get this phrase that we use so often when we have guests, uh, this is a phrase from the book Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams, and is actually just an attempt by a not very eloquent character trying to sum up, you know, everything when he's asking for what is the meaning of everything. everything. <laughs> <laughs> and doesn't do a very good job and therefore unsurprisingly winds up getting a fairly strange answer which is to say 42 yep also that's the reason why the earth was created yes in the book but that's a separate story and frankly worth reading or listening to the radio shows which is what my husband did Ooh, i didn't know there were radio show versions yes they are kind of hard to track down these days uh, but if you are very lucky your local library might have them nice i have only ever read the first book mm -hmm. Very in fun. the five book trilogy as i yes told. which makes perfect sense if you're douglas adams except that he's dead but... or a christian because we don't do math well anyway yes but douglas adams was famously and enthusiastically an atheist so probably not for him fair enough turns out we're not the only ones that can't do math yes it's nice to be reminded of that now and then yeah. also i love math so there's like a yes tug in my heart at that but i do think that one plus one plus one equals one. So, you know, it comes and goes, I suppose. Anywho, <laughs> life is a big concept and it comes up in a few different ways in our passages for this episode. So we want, and it has been a big topic of conversation, discussion, debate, oppression for a long time, but especially in the last few months. So we're going to talk about a lot of different things that are and are not life. Yeah. The first one is perhaps the most obvious, especially if you've been listening to our episode, <laughs> our July episodes, where we had a lovely pre-roll that gave you uh, some insight into how we feel as podcasters and yes. people with uteruses about reproductive justice and abortions and abortion access. Yes. Um, Although I still can never remember if it is uteruses or uteri. It is both okay yes pace and i looked it up so that we could <laughs> i love you so, so much because okay. pace was oh. using uteri and i was using uteruses and then i had to like figure out what it really was when i was preaching about it sure yeah so reproductive justice is about life but not necessarily in the ways that it's framed by certain groups of people particularly when it comes to abortion access and those sorts of things one thing to know about reproductive justice, there's a reason why we use terms like reproductive justice and being pro-choice, being even pro-abortion, sure. or talking about choice or access. It's because this is complicated. There are a lot of people, especially Black and immigrant women, who have not had choice about reproduction. This is a historic reality and a recent reality from folks who have immigrated into this country and been held in detention centers yeah, who have undergone forced sterilization, usually by the United States government. I mean, also stretching back thousands of years to many other governments, but yes, yes, yes. many governments and the United States is just very fond of it recently. Yes. And also in history. Yeah. <laughs> the United yeah. States just has problems. So forced sterilization is in fact not choosing life. It is not a life-giving thing. Right. And that is of particular concern for, as I mentioned, Black and immigrant women, but also for trans people of all kinds who frequently face a requirement 
of sterilization in order to receive or, or as part of hormone replacement therapy. So that is problematic. The United Kingdom did sterilization of gay men. So if you've ever heard of Alan yeah. Turing, who was the person that like helped us win World War II by figuring out how to break the Nazi codes. With math. With math. Yay, math. He was sterilized. An international hero. And yeah, also he, was, he was an international like hero crap. and treated harmfully, which resulted in his death by suicide. So when we talk about sterilization in particular, that is not life in and of itself, but also like the ripple effects of like how that impacts a person's life and the options yeah. available to them and the hope available to them to keep living. And how they're treated by other people and how they're seen mm -hmm. as human beings or not. Yes. And there's a really great movie about Alan Turing. We'll link to it in the show notes. It's called The Invitation Game. While we're talking about reproductive justice, and you may be surprised that we didn't go to this place first, but forced birth is a crime against humanity. I mean that mm -hmm. quite literally, legally speaking yep. and otherwise. And I feel like we don't talk about this very often in these conversations, but pregnancy can absolutely kill the parent. And if it kills the parent, the fetus doesn't have a big chance either, especially if that person is very young or otherwise vulnerable, especially if they are disabled in some way, especially if they are living in poverty or it's in so much more a difficult. situation of domestic violence. In fact, yes. the number one cause of death of people who are pregnant is homicide. Yeah. And while we're at it, pregnancy deaths caused by suicide or overdose is around 11% and also predicted to go up significantly now that Roe is gone. Yep. And for that matter, even a normal, healthy pregnancy, like, for example, the one my mom had with me, which she hated with a passion <laughs> in the early 80s. Like, mom loves me. Mom has always said that I was the one decent thing that came out of pregnancy. <laughs> Uh, pretty much. Uh, and the only reason why she was willing to put up with it. Even a normal and healthy pregnancy will have lifelong effects on your body. Mm -hmm. Lifelong effects that they generally don't start telling you about until either you are way far into the pregnancy or until afterwards or until you hit your mid to late 30s, which is when I started hearing these stories, or they just don't when tell you at all and you have to happening. find out. Yes. Yeah. Some, sometimes they don't even tell you that then because you can't even get diagnosed because doctors don't know about this because no one talks about, you know, why about teeth reproductive out. health. Yeah. Quite a few parents who go through pregnancy lose teeth in the process of pregnancy because the baby just needs that much calcium. And no matter how many prenatal vitamins you take, <laughs> it does not matter if the baby's going to get that calcium. And the medical establishment tends to ignore all of these issues. Mm -hmm. And people who have been pregnant before you don't want to tell you these things because they don't want to scare you off. Which, on the one hand, I realize that's often, like, meant well. And on the other hand, functionally doesn't help. Intention over impact or impact over intention. Yeah, it kind of depends on what happens to you, doesn't it? So. Yep. Also, being pro-abortion pro-choice, pro-access to abortion is a faithful thing. That is a position that I hold. Not Me too. required abortion, which would be the actual opposite to anti-choice people. Yeah, no, that's weird and creepy and wrong. Yeah, but abortion should be safe and free. Yeah. That is a perspective. And there are a variety of reasons that people have for wanting an abortion. And you know what? The important reason is they want it. Yes. That is enough. It is a medical procedure. It is part of holistic and whole health care. It's just part of health care in this country. And, yeah. and part of that is because there are some life choices in this world that have to be entirely voluntary in order for them to not be, you know, horrific. Yep. And having children is one of them. And goodness knows, I have met plenty of people whose parents had them either out of a sense of obligation or because they couldn't get an abortion when they needed one and those people are miserable and don't generally have good relationships with their parents mm -hmm. <laughs> and their parents generally weren't very good at being parents yep and there are plenty of kids who were adopted who have been really vocal about 
the importance to access to abortions and not just yes. like, oh, you can just put them up for adoption. Yeah, that does not always work out the way you hope. Yeah, especially in this country. That's just not really going to do the trick. Yeah. And if you are interested in a beautiful, hilarious take on this, Unpregnant is a wonderful movie. And I've heard great things about the book, which I was introduced to the movie because someone had read the book and wanted to watch the movie with me. Sure. But it is fantastic. It is about getting access to an abortion as a teenager who lives in a state where they are required to have parental consent sure. if they try to get an abortion under the age of 18. And so it is like the journey that this kid goes on is just brilliant and hilarious. And the like people that come together around it and the pawn shop owner. It's just great. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So as a former philosophy major, <laughs> as a person who entered the ministry with a uterus, and as a person who entered a heterosexual marriage, I have at several times in my life been put into the situation where I was going to have a conversation about pregnancy and abortion, whether I wanted to or not, <laughs> because these are conversations that people seem to feel are important for them to have with <laughs> someone who is in one of those three situations, whether or not that person wants to or not, which is a whole separate conversation about, you know, mm -hmm. autonomy and all that. But as a philosophy major, I would say that the one argument that I have really never heard anyone on the anti-choice side be able to answer in any kind of functional way is that a person in this country cannot be forced to donate blood or organs or anything else of their own body to another person. You can choose to, that's fine. But like, even if you're dead, if you didn't sign a piece of paper saying you were okay with it before you died or mm -hmm. before you went into a coma or whatever, you cannot be forced. A corpse has more bodily autonomy in this country now, uh, in some places, than a pregnant person. And that's a horror story that is already happening. Yes. I don't know how else to describe it. Yeah. Yeah. That particular piece too, right? Like there are like weird things that allow like next of kin some autonomy over a corpse, but yeah. Yeah. But then you have to have agreed to have given that next of kin that power even. They can, they can stop it. They can say no. We oh, don't well, want yes. To donate. They they can veto it, but they can yeah. they can't it's a, force it's, you to donate. It's harder to force. Is but, my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Complicated hospital conversations I've had in trauma rooms. Ugly. Yeah. But yeah. if we give that level of autonomy over our donations, why can't we give that level of autonomy over pregnancy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speaking of autonomy and specifically bodily autonomy. When we're talking about abortion and reproductive justice, we are talking about bodily autonomy. We are talking about ownership of yourself, right? We, in the yeah. United States, you know, we make claims about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that requires Freedom. bodily autonomy. Yeah. And this is a conversation that we can have. This is also a conversation where, like, logic pretty much doesn't work. Yeah, no in this argument because there is and believe just, me i've tried yeah there is just a cognitive dissonance where people do not some people do not acknowledge that a person with a uterus actually has a right to be alive yeah right that they just legit don't care they don't care if they don't believe the, that a person with a uterus is a person yeah so that's like a lot of what has, we've talked about here has been or lately like people have talked about ectopic pregnancies, which sure. is a particular type of pregnancy that will never come to term. Right. It will never result in a living child. It will but never it result. will, if you don't stop it soon enough, kill, kill the, person the person who's pregnant. Yep. Yeah. And so there's been a lot about that and other examples like that, where now doctors are waiting if someone has an ectopic pregnancy until that person's life is in imminent danger Yes, before they're willing to actually intervene because we're such a litigious country. Sure. 
And that drives up medical costs. It increased mm -hmm. the number of people in a hospital at any given time. It mm -hmm. increased the need for medical care. Especially it puts more care. pressure on the healthcare system. And none of these things need to happen while we're still in a pandemic. I was going to say, while we're still in a pandemic with another one coming. Yeah. Yeah. Now, on a religious note, we certainly are both Christian, but we don't want to ignore the fact that there are people talking about this who are not Christian and who are still religious. And so mm -hmm. we have a couple of links to the writing of Rabbi Danya Rutenberg, who we love on this podcast. And if anybody wants to connect us with her, we would love to have <laughs> her be a guest on this podcast. She is fantastic. She is directly related to our whole Muppet Bible musical segment and the reason why it exists and it is just generally delightful. She has also written a wonderful blog post on the Jewish case for abortion justice mm -hmm. and has also a really useful Twitter thread on uh, the importance of gender inclusive language when talking about reproductive justice. Yes. Uh, and we can link you to both of those in our episode notes. Yeah. Also, when it comes to Islam, similar to Christianity, there are lots of different perspectives within Islam about sure. abortion and abortion access and the need for abortions. Unlike Christianity, Islam tends to focus on the situations that necessitate abortion versus conservative Christianity, especially which wants to pinpoint the exact moment to call it life, but somehow don't think that first breath is Yeah, a which viable is the position point. of Judaism and the Bible. Uh-huh. Yeah. Also, just because we are both ELCA pastors. The ELCA has an abortion statement that is a bit from 1993. Old, but within that statement, it says that access to abortions should always be, be guaranteed and available and affordable, even yes. for people living in situations of poverty. So it's got outdated language and all of that stuff. Yeah. But the basics are it needs to be affordable and legal. And having lived through some American history by now. I will also say that for a while there, it was not that controversial. Like it, it was slightly controversial in some places for a while there, but it, it was not huge mm -hmm. or like mind breaking when it came out. And then yeah. things started changing. It was turned into a flashpoint for conservative politics. Yes. And the book Jesus and John Wayne by, I think it's Kristen Dumais, does a lovely job of outlining how that change has been actually happening over the last several decades, but also like sped up very quickly. While we're at it, we do realize, of course, that often one reaction to conversations about reproductive justice is just put the child up for adoption. Mm -hmm. And that is not actually that simple. Yes, there are a number of families who would love to adopt a child, and many of them would even be reasonably decent parents and are reasonably decent human beings. That is a thing that is true. I know several of them myself. Mm -hmm. However, don't imagine for one second that taking children away from unsuitable, please understand the word unsuitable is in quotation marks, from so-called unsuitable parents doesn't already happen in this country or that it won't get worse because the foster care system is already overstretched and can be abused and it is possible that it'll get worse because I am not putting it past some of the people making these laws that the option for who to adopt the child to will eventually be taken away from the biological parent. There's a lot of complications in this, among them that none of the arguments about just put the kid up for adoption take into account folks who are living in situations of poverty and and might actually want the kid. If That's actually very common. Yeah, some, I saw a study people. recently that said that if they could afford it, plenty of people who have a child and, and put the child up for adoption would love to keep the child. But the offers are not, I'll pay for your child's food and health care and clothing. It's, I will yeah. take your child from you, which is called genocide. Yeah. This is particularly most poignant, I think, when it comes to the Indian Child Welfare Act and the ways that Native children were specifically, before this act was passed, were specifically taken away from their families. This is through the use of boarding schools and just adopted out of their communities or taken away by foster care and separated from their culture and raised without their culture, which does yeah. fall under the, the like definition of what genocide is. So this is not just happening with Native children, though it happens in a particular way because 
of tribal sovereignty, although the Supreme Court of the United States is working its hardest to actually get rid of those protections for Native families and children. But this is also what's happening, right? When they say, I'll adopt your kid, it's primarily white people offering to adopt kids who are, a lot of them, kids of color. And that would be cultural genocide because they're not going to be raised to understand or know their own culture. Right. So don't choose death. Choose life doesn't always mean and frequently does not mean pro-life in air quotes. Another thing that is, in fact, not life is slavery. I know. We're doing Yeah, some, agreed. Uh, we're doing some Sometimes obvious it feels like we have to do really obvious things on this podcast, but also, hey, while we're at it, murder is bad. <laughs> murder bad. <laughs> it is still surprising me how often that one comes up. But Yes. Owning other people as your property takes away their bodily autonomy. And bodily autonomy, ownership of yourself, as we have already stated, is part of life. Yes. Also, if you're a Christian, you believe that they were created in the image of God, just like you were. And you don't do that to the image of God. Mm -hmm. We're crying out loud. Mm -hmm. This is not rocket science. And we'll see later in our reading from Philemon that Paul works within his system and within his culture to make changes on a more individual or small community level. And in the hopes that that will grow. And he does that, I think, uh, rather well. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, part of why he ends up getting arrested is because it is working. Yeah, yeah, that that is definitely a thing that happened and eventually led to his death. And hopefully that won't happen to most of us, but we can still keep working for it. Also, one of the books that is actually really great at this is the book Kindred by Octavia Butler. Octavia Butler in general is just like fantastic. Yes. And really hard hitting, like tells truths that can be hard. Especially when we're in just like the active stages of dystopic catastrophe. So highly recommend also make sure you're either in a good headspace or like read a chapter a day or something. Sure. That's what I'm currently doing with the 1619 Project. There you go. Yeah. But Kindred by Octavia Butler um, has an African-American woman who travels in time. And part of it is like going back to the plantation where her ancestors lived. And sure. she ends up meeting what the enslaving family, who also happen to be ancestors. And so, yeah. like, has this weird, like, this experience of traveling in time and, like, being forced into chattel slavery from the present day. And so, like, that sort of jolting of experience gives a really, like, that. that's one of the ones that, like, the depiction of slavery, I think, was really helpful and illuminating. Eliminating yeah. from that word. I don't know. It was, it was a really accurate... Convicting? Convicting! Maybe? That's probably a good one. Yeah. Convicting impression. Sure. So yeah, don't enslave people. Also, scary part, the United States outlawed slavery except for people who are incarcerated. So guess what that means? That's right. Incarceration, not choosing life. Right. We've talked about it a little bit, especially our episode with L. Dowd, now Pastor L. Dowd. Yay! Last year in Easter, where we talked about abolition and the push for that, and that is part of life. And so we'll link to our episode with L if you want to learn more about that and get some more perspective on that. And also the death penalty is not life. <laughs> Murder bad. Murder bad, even when the state does it. (laughs) Yeah, just ask Jesus. Right. So that one we've already done a deep dive on for our Good Friday episode this year. So definitely we'll link to that as well. And you can check that out if you want to kind of dig deeper into that. But again, death penalty, not life. Murder bad. (laughs) So we've talked a lot about what life isn't. So what is life? Well... Life is having enough food. Life is having the health care you need. Life is getting enough education to be able to take care of yourself and others. 
life is having enough money and resources to be able to survive. Life mm -hmm. is getting the rest that you need, especially when it involves healthcare or Sabbath or just being able to be a human being on top of being able to survive. Mm -hmm. Life is play and laughter and tears and the space for the full expression of your emotions and relationships and community and creativity and creativity Ooh, I like that one yeah yeah and one of the kind of more common models for this has typically in the united states at least and in psychology circles been maslow's hierarchy of needs which recently i learned though <laughs> apparently this knowledge came out closer to you know 2019 but i recently mm. learned in the last weeks or months that Maslow actually developed this theory after spending considerable time with the Siksika Nation, which is also known as the Blackfoot Nation, and stole this information to create his hierarchy of needs. And his hierarchy of needs really focuses on individual self-actualization and individuality. But the Blackfoot model of a hierarchy of needs is based in self-actualization, which is a necessary component for community actualization, which is a necessary component for cultural perpetuity, right? The ongoing existence of a particular culture. Um, so if yes. you want to know more, we will link to an article that I found that has more information about the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And, and where it really comes from. Yeah. And if you don't have time to read the article right now and you still want to be able to classify some of these things, there is also the alternative way of doing this from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which we referenced earlier, <laughs> uh, in which it is mentioned that there is a sociologist who theorizes that civilizations go through the what, why, and where stages, roughly mm -hmm. summarized as what can we eat, why do we eat, and where shall we have lunch? <laughs> and... I'm very fond of that theory, and uh, I can definitely pinpoint some times in my own life when I have been focused on all of those. And I would like to point out that it's those last two stages, the why do we eat and where shall we have lunch stages, that are examples of actual life and not just bare need survival. Yes. Admittedly, that last example is the hardest for me so frequently. I'm like, um... <laughs> Yes. But having the option to have lunch in the first place is the good thing. Yes. So. For sure. For sure. Also, there's more to life than just the basics, as we've said, especially when it comes to creativity or laughter. The game of life is a great option. <laughs> it definitely is heavily gender binary, at least the version I yes. have from when I was a kid. You can be the gender pink or the gender blue, and depending on what decade you were born in, that will be either girl or boy for each of them. Yes. Which is actually kind of delightful. But there's there's a whole process that, you know, the, like, student loans that you take out would be a whole different game now. But, yes. So And you'd need some purple nail polish to have the non-binary folks, of course. Purple and yellow, yeah, get it in there. Sure. But the game of life, it's an adventure. Also, some of you, and I was honestly kind of surprised that you hadn't heard of this before, Emily, although you might recognize it once you see a picture, may know of Conway's Game of Life, uh, which is, the technical term for it is a cellular automaton, which didn't make a heck of a lot of sense to me. But basically what it is, is a graphical representation of energy or of life. You start with a shape on a grid, and there are certain rules that this mathematical process follows for which of the squares on the grid go from black to white or from white to black and you see how far the shape can take you according to those rules it reminds me very much of the board game go in some ways if you've ever played that uh, but it's a very interesting take on on the unexpected nature of life uh, huh. it reminds me of this game that i have played that's on my kindle that where you like it gives you different numbers across and down and you like block off certain pat like a certain pattern in each column and in each row 
that correspond okay. to each other, and then it creates a picture. Cool. That sounds a little bit like Minesweeper, but maybe not. Minesweeper is like when you're trying to find bombs. Well, yes, but also there are the numbers that tell you how many boxes, oh, how many. Yeah, this one is like there's a set, a series of numbers at the top. So it might be one, three, one. So there's one in a row and then three in a row and then one in a row. But you don't know how big the gap is between them. Sure. Okay. It's fun when I'm on an airplane with my Kindle. Yeah. Also, we would be remiss if we didn't quote Jurassic Park in this episode in this deep dive <laughs> as a reminder that life finds a way and let's not take that as like inspiration for trying yeah. anything because at this moment the world does not need more scientific horror stories <laughs> that is true we don't I'm need saying... you to create dinosaurs in fact we've recently discovered that we still have dinosaurs because birds are in fact not just descended from dinosaurs but actual dinosaurs. So, A, all your dino nuggies are, in fact, dinosaur nuggets, not just chicken nuggets, shaped like dinosaurs. Yes. And. <laughs> oh, goodness. Chicken nuggets. Chickens are dinosaurs. It's yeah. even more accurate than we had Yeah. Thought. Wow. Yeah. And also, we don't need other types of dinosaurs to be created that could kill us all. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Although now I'm seeing cats in a whole new heroic light of saving us from dinosaurs by killing them. <laughs> but <laughs> maybe not always. Life finds a way. Yes. And speaking of playing with life without, you know, murdering or actual murder, uh, there is also, of course, the series of games called Sims uh, in which you can control tiny little digital people and have them do various things. And you have a varying amount of control over their lives, which is kind of up to you. And, you know, some people use this to create long lived families that are happy and content and uh, accomplish many things and uh, generally very successful and, and wonderful. And some people use this to, you know, torture tiny little digital people. And at least they're, getting those urges out on things that aren't actually people, I guess. Mm -hmm. I, also, sometimes it's funny. So uh, I'll get a little bit more into The Sims later in this episode. But. Indeed. Our first reading for today is from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. Moses reminds the Israelites that their choices matter. They can choose what God has pointed out as good and life-giving and live the life that leads to, or they can choose what isn't and deal with those consequences. So one of the themes in this passage is the idea of new land. In this case, God is showing them the land they are to take over and occupy, which is problematic and a thing called colonization and yeah. bad. But it's also reminded me, though it is not quite the same, of The Lion King, where Simba is being shown the land and all that the light touches is yours. And sadly, the thing that the light doesn't touch is the elephant graveyard. And elephants are wonderful and we should all be kinder to them. Sure. Absolutely. Choose life for elephants. <laughs> Choose life for elephants. Yes. Absolutely. Good. So when I read verse 15, uh, we read... See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity, like God says. And probably this is not usually quite as clear as the choice of cake or death offered in the Portal video game. Uh, but <laughs> essentially, it kind of seems like that's what God's offering. Uh, spoiler alert, if you haven't finished the game yourself, uh, the cake is only sort of a lie. The cake being a lie was a meme for a while. Ooh. But it, it turns out that there was cake, although you're not actually allowed to have any. It was in a place where you could never get to it. So. Rude. I know. It looked really yummy, too. I believe you. I also looked at verse 15 and the options of life and prosperity or death and adversity. And definitely was like, um, hashtag false binary, which will surprise yeah. probably no one. Yeah. But when I think about life and particularly like in fiction and stuff, the like choosing life does not mean you don't have adversity. And frequently, especially like in Ember in the Ashes, Laya's mom ultimately chooses life, but she faces a lot of adversity and hardship first. 
plus she faces death and causes death in order to get to that point where she can choose life. And ultimately, her life is helping people who have died. So super complicated. There were lots of spoilers in that. But you've had time to tell me. Yeah. Sure. I mean, also, you talked about Ember in the Ashes. Pretty yeah, random, people have ta- so. had time to tell me that, like, please no spoilers. And nobody has. Yeah. So. And then in verse 17, uh, after a discussion about uh, being obedient to God, we read... But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them. Okay, but this is not about being deaf. This is not about being able to hear, as the including the part about the heart turning away makes clear. Uh, Beethoven the musician, for example, is not being threatened here. Whether or not Beethoven the dog is able to follow instructions uh, <laughs> or uh, can hear you to begin with, I don't actually know I because I haven't seen the movie. I used to love the movie. Definitely. Dog can... Dog can definitely hear. I used to love the Beethoven movies. But, I watched them all But does up. the dog listen is the real question. Oh, no. Um, Why would the dog listen? <laughs> of course. What kind of a movie would it be if the dog listened? And you claim to not understand cats. <laughs> fair. Fair. <laughs> and then in verse 19, we read from God, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Now, aside from our entire episode about blessings and curses that you can definitely check out and we will link to, in Ember in the Ashes, there's a great example of this, which again with the spoilers, but Hmm. the scholars at one time in history chose death. They chose to steal secrets to magic and use them to harm the people that they stole them through from and that resulted in hardship for literally ever like up until Laya's day the scholars are enslaved and face significant hardship right and then our second reading for this episode is philemon verses 1 through 21 the shortest book in the bible consisting of only one chapter paul and his sibling in christ onesimus write to the man who thinks he owns onesimus appealing to the recipient to free Onesimus in celebration of the faith that the three of them share. So one of the themes in this passage is, of course, slavery, the enslavement of human beings. Also known as don't do that. Yes, also known as not life, murder, bad. So I was reminded, I think today I saw the tweet, but there was a tweet by a professor who is do, who is teaching black geographies. Oh, cool. Yeah. And they posted the list of readings for the class. And as I was looking through them, I saw Homegoing. And I was like, I wonder if this is the book I... I, I think I've read this book, right? And Homegoing by Ya Gyasi, who is Ghanaian, is about Ghanaian half-sisters who are separated in Ghana. And one is enslaved and trafficked to the United States, and one stays in Ghana, Mm -hmm. and it traces their descendant. Like, each chapter is a different generation, and so it goes through, like, the journey to the United States and enslavement there and what that looks like and freedom and all of that stuff, and it's, it's fascinating. But in general, this list is fantastic, and we will include it in the episode description if you are interested in more of Black geography, especially in the context of enslavement of peoples and those sorts of things. Then in verse 9, we read from Paul, Yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. So admittedly, he is actually in prison so there's a literal component to the prisoner in yeah yeah that's Christ fair. jesus but this always makes me wonder like is it the basis of love or the basis of peer pressure are you saying that paul considers jesus a peer because that no the basis of love appealing to philemon on the basis of love yes yeah okay i thought you i thought never mind oh i don't know what you were I thought you were saying that Paul was appealing to uh, uh, Philemon on the basis of love for Jesus as opposed to on the basis of being peer pressured by Jesus. Oh, no. Love from Paul 
and peer pressure from Paul. Yes. I think okay. are like basically the same thing in Paul's mind. Yeah, that's fair. Just because you love someone doesn't mean you'll never peer pressure them. That's probably fair. It's true. And like I have had a different understanding of this passage ever since Dr. David Rhodes did it as a scripture by heart for a okay. class I had in seminary. And hearing like and then like had different people be different characters that are named in the letter and to hear that sort of an appeal for Onesimus was fantastic and really brought home the like Paul is working within his culture to shift the way people think about things and letting that be the thing that shifts more broadly but this reminded me of the Hunger Games when Katniss manages to not die or kill PETA in the 74th Hunger Games in the first book. And then Snow has to save face by making right. sh- like trying to make sure people know that it was because they loved each other so very much, which is a lie. And ultimately, he does not save face in that way. Yeah. And then in verse 14, we read, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent, in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Gee, doing things only with someone's consent. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe that's important. Maybe like not forcing them to give birth to a child? Carry a pregnancy? Hmm. Yeah, that seems, that seems reasonable. Also not forcing them to get sterilized. Hmm. You know. Fascinating. Hmm. Also, I feel like this seems like an appropriate time to tell the story, and possibly that I should. I may have slightly disturbed one of my philosophy classes in college by pointing out the difference between voluntary and involuntary actions by holding a pocket knife. Actually, the pocket knife might have just been sitting on my desk at the time, and saying that I was, you know, choosing to not stab the person in front of me, and that that meant that that was a voluntary Uh, lack of action on my part Mm -hmm. because I was making that choice and I knew the person in front of me and was quite he was quite aware that I wasn't going to stab him that's good we were having an ongoing argument at the time and this may have been another step in that but (laughs) there was never going to be any actual stabbing involved and we all knew that perfectly well Mm mm-hmm but he did make a very entertaining face. So good for him. But I also pointed out that if I didn't actually have a pocket knife on me at the time, Mm -hmm. it wouldn't be that I was choosing not to stab him. It would be that I didn't have anything to stab him with. That would be involuntary. Mm. I did not actually have the option. (laughs) And therefore, it would be involuntary. I think I was somehow trying to expand on an ongoing conversation we were having about a Matrix, one of the Matrix movies at the time, the first one, probably, because I happened to go to college and major in philosophy right after the right around the time when the first Matrix movie came out. And we spent a lot of time on that movie. (laughs) I believe it. And then in verse 19, we read, I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your owing me even your own self, (laughs) which I love because it's like, I will repay this debt, but don't forget the like way ginormous priceless debt that you owe me. Yeah. You're welcome. Right. Which is like code for, (laughs) so we're good here, right? (laughs) Again, I still think that Paul's theme song should be You're Welcome from Moana. (laughs) You're welcome. I think that would be fantastic. I believe I've said that before on this podcast. I don't remember it, but I love it. (laughs) We had a guest for that episode, but I don't remember who it was. Anyway, (laughs) what it made (laughs) me think of was the idea of like life debts and like saving a person's life. And there's a lot of fan fiction about life debts, particularly in terms of Severus Snape who owes a life debt to James Potter because James Potter saved Snape's life. And there is like so much fan fiction, like teasing apart and like fan theories of how life debts would play out in the later books. And it was fascinating to me. Yeah. And they don't always go quite that way. Yeah. In the Star Wars universe, uh, Han, Solo, and Chewbacca start their friendship through a life debt. Han saves Chewie's life without really realizing what he's done, if I remember right. Mm. So Chewbacca goes with him until he can save his life. And uh, they wind up becoming friends and uh, sticking together anyway. Nice. So, uh, And then in verse 21, we read, Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. Okay, so generally speaking, I am not in favor of emotional <laughs> blackmail. Mm-hmm. I realize that that sounds like a caveat, but that's because it is. 
<laughs> because the one time when I do kind of appreciate and almost love emotional blackmail is when people who have a knack for it are using their power for good. Mm -hmm. Normally speaking, I am not a big fan of getting people to do stuff in the church through using guilt trips. And yet occasionally it really just works beautifully. <laughs> and I can acknowledge that uh, without, you know, officially condoning it uh, and so i am not necessarily officially condoning what paul is doing here but i am saying he's apparently pretty good at it and <laughs> i can appreciate that and it reminds me of how the character sam vimes in the disc world books by terry pratchett knows perfectly well that he does have an impulse for evil like if he was willing to allow himself he could be a truly horrible person mm. but instead of allowing himself to do that he keeps that in check with his conscience and he uses his evil impulses to help him understand bad people better and stop them hmm. as opposed to dexter who uses his serial murderer tendencies to murder serial murderers yeah i don't yeah that's not exactly the same thing exactly but yeah <laughs> Like, there are other worse options available. I can acknowledge that. And yet still, but there are not better exactly options perfect. Too. Yeah. And then our final reading for this episode is from Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 33. Jesus reminds those following him that when God is the most central part of your life, that can and sometimes does mean losing other parts of your life. So one of the themes that Jesus talks about in this passage is the idea of planning ahead. Yeah. Is a foreign concept to some. <laughs> hey, it's not my fault. It's genetic. I have ADHD. <laughs> I did not call you out on that. You called yourself <laughs> out on that one. Thank you very much. But it got me wondering how many authors, especially like young adult dystopia authors, actually plan ahead for all of the books they write. Because mm. they, they frequently end up with like a trilogy or like Ember in the Ashes is a four book series. And I don't know. Did they like plan that out from the start or did they, or are they more like L Frank Baum and the wizard of Oz where like he wrote one and then kids loved it and like wrote in and were like, please tell us more, tell us more, tell us more. And so then he wrote more. So I follow a number of authors on Twitter mm. and having written some fan fiction myself. No, I'm not telling you my online pseudonym. <laughs> goes any number of ways. Sometimes you have it planned out beautifully. Some people are really fond of writing outlines in advance and then going back and writing everything. Mm -hmm. And also sometimes like things just happen. People say things and you did not expect them to do that. One of my favorite Twitter follows uh, Ursula Vernon, mm -hmm. who also goes by the pseudonym uh, T. Kingfisher when she's writing uh, children's books, mm -hmm. recently tweeted that she's figured out how the next novel in one of her series will go because she was listening to Nine Inch Nails in the truck. <laughs> And she made a connection and boom, now she knows how that's going to end. Nice. So it's remarkable how that works. Yeah. Makes sense. And I've also seen a couple of authors say, I was not planning on writing this book, but this person just would not shut up. So <laughs> I mean, that's how <laughs> those are my favorite. That's how Divergent came to be was Veronica Roth was trying to write a story about Tobias, also known as Four. Mm -hmm. And sure. Then this whole story about Triss came out. And so she's like, okay. And that explains why the ending is more about four than about Triss. But. Sure. And in verse 26, we read Jesus say, Whoever comes to me and does not hate their parents, wife and children, siblings, yes, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. So that's a lot. Wow. <laughs> uh -huh. And I've heard this interpreted any number of ways. But one of the interpretations I appreciate is a sort of related to the way that I hear people interpret the Jedi code. Sometimes the mm -hmm. Jedi code specifies that a Jedi cannot have attachments, which in some somewhat casual conversations I've heard as interpreted as you're allowed to have sex, but you can't fall in love, which is a little like painting with a broad brush there. Yeah. But most of the more serious conversations I've heard about the Jedi code among people who actually like think about ethics and things in Star Wars would yeah in Star Wars which you know is a thing sometimes quite a few is it's more along the lines of you don't have attachments that would keep you from doing the right thing you don't have attachments that would stop you from doing your job as a Jedi or if you do you don't be a Jedi anymore uh, that's you know how that works mm -hmm. and so Jesus is saying that if it comes to a choice between you know God and doing the right thing or 
your parents, your spouse and children, your siblings, your life. Mm -hmm. Well, you know which way you're supposed to go. And sometimes that sucks. And so Captain Gregson from Elementary, the TV show, you should not cover it up and frame someone else for it just because she's your daughter if she's killed someone, especially if she's in the position to kill again. So. Truth. And then in verse 28, we read, For which of you intending to build a tower does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether they have enough to complete it? Okay, but who can actually take into account everything, including something like God changing up all the languages <laughs> and scattering people throughout the world? Hmm. Hashtag bless me with Babel, please. You know, I have definitely heard the always add 10% to whatever your budget is for a construction that's project true. rule, but it must have been a lot more than 10% with the Tower of Babel. That's fair. That's true. <laughs> and I imagine nowadays it'll be more than 10% with like all of the storms and stuff that are Extra happening. costs. Yeah. Yeah. I also read that verse and it occurred to me as I did that one of the reasons why I really enjoy watching people build things in The Sims on YouTube or on Twitch sometimes uh, is that if there is a budget, it is completely self-imposed. Hmm. Like you can choose to build with a budget or you can just say, you know, I'm just going to go all out on this and have a good time mm -hmm. and go wild and have fun. Sometimes there is remarkably precise planning and very, very detailed notes on what they're going to do. Sometimes all of the planning immediately goes out the window when you find out that something doesn't work the way you thought it was going to. Sometimes you give up on the budget halfway through the project and just decide to build what looks cool because it looks awesome, you know? Mm -hmm. The whole thing is just very soothing to me in ways I can't entirely explain. But if you would like to watch people build things in The Sims uh, in a soothing, wholesome manner, uh, there is an account on YouTube called Lil Simsy, mm -hmm. and she is very wholesome and also explicitly queer and trans affirming. Nice. So. It has, I have not played Sims since I was a kid. And you're making me want to play again. Yes. Uh, she dangerous. does occasionally murder people. Uh, she's very fond of having people jump into the Piranha Pond. Uh, it's kind of an ongoing thing. But she also has a character, Stanley, who is constantly dressed in a hot dog costume and does bizarre things for money. And it, it's just very fun. But she spends most of her time building. Yes. And then in verse 31, we read, Or what king going out to wage war against another king? will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. Now, granted, you actually like that might actually be a fair match, depending. <laughs> but I was thinking about in the book Fire from the Graceling series, Prince Brigan and Fire and everybody doing the like military planning and whatnot, definitely plan for war. But they also have to plan strategy for their like corrupt opponents, Lord Gentian and his son Gunnar, and Lady Mergda and her brother, Lord My Dog. Because there's like a big party and everyone's invited because we're not officially at war, because technically you're a subject and a wealthy subject, and so you're invited, and then we know that bad stuff's gonna happen. And so there's this whole like plotting and planning and moving pieces and cool. Because, you know, war and whatnot. Yeah. <laughs> and now for our newest segment, Let's Make a Muppets Musical, where we make a musical out of Muppets. And the Bible. And the Bible. Indeed. Yeah. Do you have any to start with? Well, I, I had a couple thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, one is that looking at the book of Philemon, I could totally see Miss Piggy as Paul here writing saying mm -hmm. so so you're gonna do this right you're gonna free him you're totally gonna free him right right see philemon come on <laughs> see i was thinking of kermit more as the paul character i i mean I, kermit would definitely want to free onesimus but i he doesn't really strike me as Not the as... like emotionally blackmailing type <laughs> whereas <laughs> miss piggy is perfectly happy to Say, you're going to do this, right? Of course you are. Mm -hmm. You owe me, don't you? And so, yeah. Or it could be Gonzo and Camilla and the Swedish chef. <laughs> and the Swedish chef is Philemon and Camilla is Onesimus. I would actually love to read that letter. I don't think it would sound anything like Paul's letter to Philemon. Oh, of course not. But it would be super interesting. <laughs> and of course, the Swedish chef would respond with, bork, bork, bork. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So... Let us know who you would cast for this. And if you want to write Gonzo's letter to 
the Swedish chef, please write it and we will definitely share it. Yes, that would be fabulous. Also, uh, while we're doing that, I was thinking as we read the the verses in the gospel about, but nobody's going to build a tower without doing some planning first, and no king is going to try to go to war without some planning first. And I can totally hear Statler and Waldorf in the background laughing, because of course people try to build things without planning first. Like, that literally happens all the time. You probably have stories about your own neighbors who have tried to build a shed and failed miserably. (laughs) And, uh, of course, king try to go to war without planning first because that happens all the time too because why bother taking the lives of your subjects seriously it's so, true it, like this is this is a thing and statler and waldorf would be laughing at jesus yeah. right now or when w like went to war and then got rid of yeah. all of the people that were competent in it just before it. yeah it's amazing how that works indeed indeed but yes, if you want to write Gonzo's letter to the Swedish chef, to free Camilla, please, please, please do. do. That please sounds do. fabulous. Indeed. Thanks for joining us. Catch us next time when we'll discuss nerdery connections to the scripture readings for the 14th Sunday after Pentecost. This podcast has been produced by us, Kay Roloff and Emily Ewing. For more fun, check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Nerds at Church, or contact us at nerdsatchurch at gmail.com. Also, if you like what you've heard, rate us or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Facebook, or wherever you catch your podcasts. If you want access to our uncut guest episodes and interviews, live Q&As, and more, support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash nerdsatchurch. It is definitely cheaper than any sort of hospital bill you'll get for the ways that you sustain your own life through medical and health care. Yeah, that's true. Also, let us know on Facebook or Twitter who you would cast for Let's Make a Muppets Musical for this episode. As the ancient Christian said, Pax Vobiscum. <laughs>